thank you for coming. Um, as he said, this is going to talk about uh, HV boundary, private wallet access, SSH credential injection. Um, there was a talk from my, my coworker, Pete Payson, earlier. If you saw that, that was more of a high level talk. This is going to go kind of lower level in terms of implementation, technical side of things, and so on. I'm Jeff Mitchell. Oops. That's right, it's here. I'm Jeff Mitchell, I'm principal engineer at HashiCorp. I've uh, been around HashiCorp for a long time, so I've worked on Vault originally, um, and then sort of moved over to kickstart the Boundary project internally. And so uh, I know a lot about Boundary, and I'm um, uh, happy to share it with you. So I'm gonna, a quick overview, so some concepts like what is Boundary, just in case you don't really know much about it. Um, I'm gonna talk about controllers and workers, because that terminology is gonna be really important for much of the rest of the talk. I'm gonna talk about multi-hop, um, and then I'm gonna get into those two specific uh, things that are the kind of the overall subject of the talk. Um, I'm not gonna do any demos uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, P. Payson talked before me. There's this Learn Lab immediately afterwards, which I definitely recommend you check out, where you can try these things yourself. Um, but we wanted to kind of save the time to do more kind of focused, like technical information. So uh, no demos here, sorry. Um, but I do recommend checking out the Learn Lab directly afterwards. All right, so for those of you that don't know or just want a refresher, just a quick, like, what is Boundary? So um, you might have seen some of these slides or very similar ones uh, at the keynote. They had much cooler versions than mine. Mine are sort of out of date, I now realize. Um, so the traditional access, you know, in, this, in the cloud operating model, traditionally you had this sort of, like, moat and, uh, uh, moat and drawbridge kind of thing where, you know, you have this, this firewall, and if you get inside the firewall, you're assumed to be trusted, right? You know, maybe that's via VPN, maybe that's via uh, IP rules or something. But, it's assumed that you're trusted, and once you're inside, you have access to everything. Um, so you have this like kind of hard shell, soft interior. Um, you know, but when you have this cloud operating model, things are much more complex. So you have all these different um, these different environments. You need to manage complexity of those. A lot of them are ephemeral. Um, you know, and you want things like automated onboarding of targets and identities, and you know, you need to be able to really understand what's happening with every transaction, every sort of interaction and communication that's going on. So last, last of the copied slides, I promise. Uh, so HashiCorp has a number of products in this sort of secure and zero trust world. Um, Vault is focused on machine authentication authorization. So it does a lot of stuff with secrets. It's kind of a Swiss army knife of secret management and all sorts of things around uh, identity, secrets, um, encryption, all that kind of stuff. So all, all purpose kind of sec uh, security tool. Console's focused on machine to machine access uh, from like a network perspective. And Boundary's focused on the human to machine side. So trying to you know, help you get to a point where like humans can connect to machines and, and kind of focus on the security requirements there. So Boundary, very high level, open source secure remote access tool. Um, it authenticates and authorizes network connections. It has a role-based role access control using existing IDPs. So like OADC is how you would generally use it. Um, audit logging, historical session warehouse. Uh, integrations for automatic onboarding of targets from like AWS and Azure, um, full Terraform support, um, API first, and credentials can come from Vault or via built-in capability. And these are just some of the features, like there are many, many more features in it, but this is just a very quick overview, not to you know, make the slide kind of uh, too, too big. So what is HTTP boundary? Um, you know, HTTP boundary is us saying, hey, you know, it's not that hard to operationalize boundary, but if you don't want to, like, yeah, we'll do it for you, and we'll give you these extra features along the way. Um, and those extra features are some of the ones that I'll be talking about in this talk. So some terminology before we dive into kind of the, the meat of it. Um, controllers and workers. A controller is an API server. So if you're, you know, a user that's interacting with boundary, in almost all cases, you'll be interacting with the controller. Um, it handles uh, resource management, so like, you know, CRUD, create, read, update, delete, and lists of resources. Um, it handles configuration, uh, management, and it's the thing that authorizes user sessions. So if a user wants to say like, hey, I wanna make a network connection, that's the thing that it talks to um, that gives it a token to enable that. Um, it currently uses an RDBMS uh, for state coordination. So you can actually, the, the controllers themselves are stateless, so you can stand them up um, for redundancy and just point them at the same database and everything is, is, is fine. So a worker, is a task runner and it handles jobs and by far the vast majority of jobs that, uh, that you know, a user would be aware of are proxying network sessions. So they go to a controller and say, can I please connect? And then the worker, um, you know, they're given an author authorization token for that session, they give it to the worker, the worker, uh, it can proxy it. Um, 
uh, workers are not stateless because they're handling stateful network streams, uh, but we, you know, we're f we've been building in things like um, draining of connections, so you can do like graceful shutdown, uh, and you can scale them up. So if you add more workers, then we'll just distribute um, network sessions across different workers, uh, and it's all kind of seamless, so it scales pretty well. Um, and there are two types of workers. So HCP managed, those are the ones that we manage with HTTP boundary, and self-managed. And these sound fairly similar, but there are actually some important differences. So I'm gonna to refer to self-managed workers by our internal nickname for them, which is BYOW or bring your own worker. Um, so you'll see BYOW on this talk, um, and I'm doing that to kind of make it very clear, like disambiguate like HTTP worker versus, uh, versus your own. Because we, you know, one's HTTP managed, one's self-managed, and if I said managed worker, I didn't want to you know, cause confusion. So I'll be using BYOW. Um, it's our term for self-managed workers that you connect to HTTP boundary and that provide access to private resources. Um, for example, uh, across clouds, like maybe you have um, a worker in GCP and a worker in Azure and a worker in AWS to get to resources across those, uh, on-premise data centers, um, you know, corporate networks, uh, even manufacturing sites, which a lot of people we've talked to are really kind of intrigued by this for gaining access to you know, the machines that are running manufacturing lines. Um, so, you know, I'm sorry, HTTP boundary, because it's running publicly, it can't natively get into your private networks, and so this is a way to enable access there. Um, Anywhere where you have like distinct network segments without reachability, you may want to have, um, uh, you might want to put in a worker. And one thing I want to mention, by the way, before going through this slide, uh, about the workers is, you know, even though it's called boundary, the boundary doesn't have to be public-private. Um, it can be public-public, it can be private-private. So for instance, if you have a group of machines within your, you know, within your data center, you want to say, access to those machines must go through boundary. I don't care about the rest of the machines, but these particular ones need to go through boundary. Then you can do, um, you know, you could set up like IP firewalling to make sure that like the, the, you know, the connections have to come from a boundary worker. And you can set up credential uh, stuff that I'll be talking about later. And you can kind of mix and match that. So, you know, even though it's called boundary, it doesn't have to be public-private, even though that's what most people are using it for. Um, so this is an example of worker topology with workers in distinct network segments. So we have this managed worker uh, that's part of HTTP boundary. We have a corporate BYOW, so that might be something that you use to gain access to. Um, if you have like a, a fancy networking gear, you know, you might need to SSH into those if there's a problem or something. Um, and then a data center that has another, uh, another worker in the data center, and you might have Vault running in the data center, which we'll use for part of this, uh, this demo. So to this point, um, the Vault credential store requires access from the boundary controller to reach out to Vault. So what would that look like in this kind of setup? There we go. Uh, there we go. So we could require a public port allowing reachability into the data center, but this is obviously not ideal. Um, you know, you want to keep your data center private, that's the whole point. And if you have a public port just for uh, the controller, then it's really, you know, not what you want. Um, and we have, so we have a solution to this. Uh, but understanding it first requires me to talk about some groundwork that we've been laying since the 0 0.10 release, which came out in, I think it was May, uh, along with the HTTP boundary beta. Um, and that is called multi-hop. So multi-hop. Um, I'm gonna read a bit off this slide because I took a lot of time trying to figure out how to say this better. Um, but after this slide, I'm gonna have uh, diagrams and I will walk through it. And so just bear with me. So. The multi-app capability is a, a way that we developed of authorizing workers to the boundary cluster and then allowing them to authenticate to other cluster members, um, which are not necessarily the controllers. And this process along the way provides necessary cryptographic material that we can make use of for other purposes, and we'll see an example of that, and also network access capabilities, which we're also gonna see an example of. Um, and so it basically gives us these primitives that we can use to build new features on top. Um, building this, we can uh, have complex network topologies that we can um, satisfy with boundary, and then we can kind of securely sync commands along these topologies to specific workers. All right, so let's look at what it looks like. So let's say that you, know, you have a, uh, a topology like this. We can use it to support new features with topologies like this. And that, you know, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more why that's, impor why that's important if it's not immediately obvious. Uh, but it mostly comes down to not having uh, public access to your, your, uh, your stuff. All right, so let's, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. So how does authorization work? If you wanna like, stand up some of these workers and authorize them to each other, how does this work? Um, we actually have two supported flows. Um, so in the first flow, which we call controller-led, uh, 
um, the operator fetches an activation token from the controller. So it goes to the controller says, I'd like to register a new worker. Here's the name, here's the description, uh, here's other information. Please give me an activation token. And it gets that returned. And then uh, the orchestrator or operator can send that uh, to the, the, the worker uh, via configuration file, a file on disk or an environment variable. Um, and so this is something that you would usually use with something like Terraform is like a really good example of this kind of flow. We also have what we call the worker-led flow, where the worker generates a registration request and the operator retrieves this from uh, either the startup information that's printed or from the file on disk that we write it to. And then the operator or orchestrator sends it into, uh, into the controller. Um, so regardless of which of these methods you use to authorize the worker, uh, the authorization credentials are single use, they're time limited, and they're protected against replay. So if you use one and then someone else tries to use it again, it will not work. Um, and either way, the results are that you get authentication credentials that are unique to each worker, so we can uniquely identify each worker in the system. We get a trusted root uh, using a, a certificate authority, so we have a root certificate authority that's owned by the controller that's trusted and we have periodic rotation that happens automatically. And so what we do is we have two sets of credentials valid at any time uh, that are each for, valid for two weeks, and we rotate them once a week. So essentially, we have your current credentials, your next credentials, and then once a week, we rotate those. Um, no secret or private authentication information is ever transmitted in the clear. So this includes the operator or orchestrator. The operator and orchestrator that's doing this dance, um, either in the controller-led flow or the worker-led flow, Either way that you do it, um, they never see a secret key, you know, an encryption key, uh, uh, any sort of secret value. Um, so we're very careful about that. Um, and the, uh, sorry, just an example. So I talked about Terraform might be a good reason for doing something like a, a controller-led flow. Uh, for humans, often like the worker-led flow is easier. So if you're starting up HTTP Boundary, a new cluster, and you're doing sort of the initial kind of 15 minute onboarding, then since we have you as part of the onboarding, start up a worker, you know, there's the token right there. And so you just like feed it into the box and it's very easy. So we wanted to really uh, be able to handle any sorts of flows that you would, uh, that you would build on top. Okay, so back to this, this uh, zoom in diagram. So once authorized, the corporate worker needs to authenticate to its upstream whenever it starts up. So here's how it works. First, the corporate worker presents its uh, TLS certificate, which was signed by the controller during the authorization step, and a signed cryptographic knot, so that's a one-time use uh, value that is generated randomly. And it signs that value, presents it to the managed worker. The managed worker first verifies that as part of this TLS connection that the client cert it has a, uh, is valid according to the root CA that's shared between them. Um, of course, that's not sufficient in and of itself. You need to do revocation checking to make sure that, that the certificate is still valid. So what happens next is that the managed worker sends the signed nonce to the controller. And the nonce was signed by the, uh, the key that is the same key that, um, that the corporate BYOW has. It's the private key for the certificate. So it sends that off to the controller. The controller loads it up and says, okay, you know, can I find this key correlating to a worker in my, you know, in my database? So if you were to delete a worker, then there would be no key left because deleting the worker would delete its cryptographic material. And so if that worker is valid within the controller right now um, and valid within the network, then it will find that key and then it will use that to validate the signature on the nonce. Um, once it's validated that, it generates a brand new server certificate um, that contains that nonce inside of it. So again, this nonce was created as part of this flow uh, by the worker randomly when it started this, this, uh, this process. And it generates a fresh server certificate that it sends back to uh, the managed worker. Now, one of the keys here is only the controller has the root certificate. So only it can generate this certificate. The managed worker does not. So it, all, all the managed worker has is it has its own client certificate. It has um, now a server certificate, but it cannot generate it itself. Uh, so that the managed worker then uses that service certificate to, um, to as its part of the TLS connection establishment and, uh, and sends that back. And then the, the BYOW there then looks at the certificate that came in from the, uh, the managed worker and says, does that contain my nonce, the same nonce that I used? All of this, this entire flow uh, happens within the context of a single connection. So there's no step of like, I'm gonna send off the nonce, then I'll make another connection and see if it comes back. It's all part of a single connection. And so we can be you know, sure that if the, server that, you know, if the server certificate that comes back is valid and signed by the root certificate that's shared by both, that's, that's uh, owned by the controller, that you know, it comes back as part of that same TLS connection that's happening, um, then we, are, you know, we can trust that. And so at this point, 
we now have a trust connection between the workers. So as you may imagine, I've simplified things quite a bit. Like really getting into the, into the details of this would go into uh, you know, a lot about TLS and a lot about like various encryption schemes and all that. So I've, I've simplified this quite a bit, but that's, that's really how it works. Um, and one other thing that I wanna, I wanna bring up, because it's gonna be important uh, very shortly, is that as part of the authorization process, um, each worker generates an, a shared encryption key with the controller that is known only to the controller and to that worker. So you can see I'm showing now a key that's marked X, which is shared between the managed worker and the controller, and a key that's marked Y, which is uh, shared between the corporate BYOW and the controller. And they are, not the, they are not the same, and they do not have each other's keys. So we now have a trusted connection between the workers, and by extension, we have a, a trusted connection between the corporate BYOW and the controller. We can repeat this process to connect the data center worker to the corporate worker. And now you can see like we have key Z, so that's now shared by uh, the, the data center BYOW and the controller and nobody else. And any others that we want. So whatever the topology, if there's a path to the controller, then a worker can communicate uh, through any of the intermediaries. Um, and you know, when actually looking at, at, at standing up kind of a tree of workers like this, it's, it's really you know, fairly simple. All you do is authorize a worker and then you tell it what its upstreams are and, uh, and that's it, and it just works. So multi-hop, you know, basically this, this kind of core authentication authorization capability, this was introduced in Boundary 0.10. If you've tried out HTTP Boundary beta and you've used a worker to connect to it, you've used this flow. Like this is uh, how all BYOWs work. Um, there are many future uses for this feature, uh, such as multi-hop session proxying. Um, but for now, we're gonna talk about the first feature that we built using this paradigm uh, called um, private vault access. So if the controller cannot reach vault directly, so if you remember before I showed that diagram of the controller having to like go through a public port to the data center, which we don't really wanna do, if the controller can't reach vault directly, the operator can tell it which worker or workers do have reachability via a filter on the worker tags. Um, and so essentially what this looks like is when you're standing up a credential store in Boundary and you say this is for Vault, you say, okay, you know, I'm gonna set up a, uh, a worker filter uh, that, that uses the same syntax that's used elsewhere in Boundary and also in console for filtering. And you can put a tag on the worker that says, you know, I, I have a tag called Vault Access uh, with a value of true. And then I can go to the worker filter and I can say, okay, here's the filter to use. I want you to look for a, a worker that has a tag, uh, a tag value of true for the key vault access. Um, and it's, it's relatively simple. Once that happens, the controller and the workers figure out how to route the request. You don't have to say anything other than which worker can reach vault. That's it. Uh, all the routing happens internally. So we're gonna look at what that looks like. So first, the controller generates a vault request that contains all of the parameters necessary. So the authentication token to use, the path within vault, the request type. Um, if it's like a post request, you might have body parameters. Um, whatever's, ne whatever's needed to make a call to vault uh, is, is packaged up. The controller then encrypts it to the destination worker using the key that's shared between them. I'll get to that in a second. Passes it off to the first hop, which would be the managed worker. The managed worker then says, okay, how do I get to the data center BYOW? Okay, the next hop is the corporate BYOW, and passes it off to there. And here's where I wanna step back. I said I'd bring up encryption again. So going back to encryption for a moment. So it adds extra defense against compromise of an intermediate worker. Um, strictly speaking, we have authenticated this connection. Uh, we have this you know, series of hops of, uh, of authenticated connections, and we trust it, and the connection is fine. On the other hand, you know, if you imagine that maybe someone manages to gain access to the corporate BYOW box and start dumping memory or something along the lines, then you know, it might gain access to some of Boundary's functions. But because it, this value is encrypted to, uh, to the, the data center BYOW, then a compromise of the corporate BYOW does not reveal the vault token, and when the response comes back, it doesn't reveal the secrets that were generated. So this is defense in depth, right? And we try to layer in defense in depth wherever we can. We look for opportunities to do so, and, um, and we take them. And so it's strictly not necessary. You know, we have these TLS connections, we've authenticated them, but why not, right? It, it's, it's an extra layer of protection. So the request finally arrives at the destination worker. The worker decrypts the request, sends it off to Vault. Vault does whatever it's gonna do with the request, uh, returns a response. It's received by the worker, we encrypt it, same reason, same method, it's a symmetric key, we encrypt it back to uh, the controller, it goes back 
exactly as you would imagine, and, uh, and then it goes back to the controller. Um, the controller then can decrypt it and make use of it. Um, so that's how private vault access works, right? We build on this multi-hop capability for the workers, um, and then we, you know, we can essentially make calls down to each individual worker. We can encrypt the payloads that we're making in these calls. We can route those calls through and, uh, and make use of that to do uh, interesting things. Um, and one of the things I want to point out with this diagram while it's up is, well, it's going to come back, but you know, while it's up now, is that uh, if you notice, the workers don't all need to connect directly to the controller. So you can stand up these trees of workers that are only connecting to other workers, and that's on purpose, right? You may have, um, and we know that we've talked to, you know, to people very interested in Boundary that are, that are wanting to run it in places where there are, there's no internet access, right? They talked about manufacturing sites, and sometimes there's literally a manufacturing site that does not have internet access, cannot reach out to HTTP Boundary, and so this is a way to, um, to allow uh, workers to just connect to whatever next hop there is. And so you can kind of build out whatever, whatever your connectivity uh, solution is, whatever your paths are, you can build that out. All right, now I'm gonna talk about credential injection. So Boundary currently supports injecting a username and either a private key or password into an SSH session, and certificate support is coming soon. Um, that is being spun up right now. Uh, that's gonna, uh, and so you can then make use of like Vault's SSH engine to generate certificates. And so we're gonna go back to this diagram. We're actually gonna step backwards in time a little bit before we make the Vault call. And so let's look at like, what happens when a user wants to gain access to this host in the data center. So first the user requests access to the host from the controller. Uh, they make that API call, they say, I wanna get to here. The controller you know, says, are you authenticated? Are you authorized to, to get there? You know, uh, what's the configuration like? So it figures it out, packages all that up into an auth authorization request, sends it back to the, uh, to the user's client. So, sorry, having some trouble with this. Uh, the controller then concludes the user's authorized. You know, as I said, it, uh, it, it, um, it does all that, but also notes that a credential is required, and so it creates that vault request that I, I kind of showed running through the, the path before. It creates that vault request, as we saw earlier, and it sends it through the worker network. Now we have the response back, and what the controller does now is it doesn't actually give that to the user. What it does is it encrypts it locally and stores it in the database. So the controller then provides this authorization token to the user that can be given to a worker. It's basically a proxy authorization token that says, here's the session ID, here's, you know, here's a, a worker, workers to connect to, um, and, and here's, uh, the, the, the way that it works is it uses kind of some advanced CLS stuff, but basically like it can authorize and authenticate the user. So they make that, that connection into the worker, the worker can look at the session ID, go get credentials from the, um, from the controller and use that to do a mutual authentication of that session between uh, the user and the worker. Um, and that's a, a trust on first use capability as well. Um, so, so the, uh, I got a little bit ahead of myself, but you know, the controller gives back that authorization token to the user, the user gives that to the worker. The worker validates the authorization token with the controller, um, and this request would actually, for, for building the slide reasons, I didn't do it this way, but this request would actually transit through the corporate BYOW and the managed worker. Um, it just, when I tried putting the, the, the arrows up there, it was getting a little confusing, but um, this actually would, it, it, we're not doing a magical path from the BYOW suddenly to the controller, it actually would go through that multi-hop. And then the controller confirms the authorization token is valid, and at this point it says, oh, I have a credential for that, and it takes it out, it takes it out of, um, out of the encrypted storage uh, in the database, and it pulls it out and it sends it to the worker, not the user, the worker. Um, and the worker can then inject it. So the worker uses this credential to create an SSH connection to the host, and then it starts passing traffic back and forth. So now we have an SSH connection uh, to the host, and, uh, and the worker you know, in injected a credential in there. So Boundary supports both brokering and injection of credentials, and I'm gonna talk about what that means and what the difference is. So in brokering, credentials are returned to the user or client for use. Um, so it exposes the credential to the user, but the benefit of this is that um, it can be used with any protocol and any type of credentials. So Boundary up to this point, up until the, you know, we added this SSH credential injection support, um, Boundary supported TCP, uh, and, and still does, but it only supported kind of just TCP proxying. 
Um, and so, you know, there wasn't a way to know like, hey, here's a particular protocol, I can inject stuff into it. So it supported TCP proxying, and so you could broker credentials back to the user. Um, one of the interesting things about this is it doesn't have to be credentials, right? You could say, hey, I wanna actually, you know, send, you know, some value that is the current value when you connect to this host, like, you know, fetch this thing, and then I can kind of update it centrally, and then every time someone connects, they see what's the current value that they need. Um, so you can kind of use it as like a little bit of a distribution mechanism, but uh, it's meant for kind of credential brokering. In injection, credentials are injected into the session via protocol decoding. So the user never sees a credential. And so, you know, if you saw the keynote today, you know, we're talking about a lot about like zero trust. What does zero trust mean to different people? Um, but, you know, one of the ways that zero trust is, that we want to approach zero trust and boundary is to get to a point where users just don't need credentials ever. And this provides a lot of like really nice benefits. Um, you know, for instance, if they manage to circumvent boundary at a network level, then uh, they don't have a valid credential anyways. So let's say that they're like, okay, I don't have, you know, I found my way into the network through the firewall. I'm not going through boundary worker, but I still don't have any way to get onto that host. Um, so that's a really nice, you know, uh, aspect of doing that credential injection. The downside is it can only be used with supported protocols and credential types. And so everything that we want to inject credentials into, we have to be able to support that protocol and decode it, uh, authenticate it, you know, do all that kind of stuff. And that's, uh, that's more complicated. Um, and these are composable. So you can actually use injection and brokering together. Uh, so as an example, you can inject an SSH credential and then broker a second factor TUTP from Vault's TUTP engine. And so if you have Linux PAM set up to use um, uh, TUTP as a second factor, you can say, okay, you don't, get the, uh, you don't get the key or the certificate to actually get in via SSH, but you know, I do that, I inject that, but here's the TUTP code that you should then type in once you get that prompt for TUTP. So, um, so it's, it's, you know, when I mentioned that it's, it can, you can kind of use this like a distribution mechanism, things like that are reasons. If you have a secondary, um, let's say that you get onto an SSH, uh, you SSH into a box, and then you have some other service there that actually Vault provides secrets for, but you need that person to have a secret on that box itself, that's another case where you can, um, you can say, okay, I don't need to know what is running on that box, what that protocol is, but I can broker that credential to the user, but they can't get onto the box in the first place unless they, uh, unless we inject that, that credential in. So in that case, brokering sort of becomes less of a security concern because you still can't get on the box without boundary being in the mix. Um, and then once they're on the box, maybe they have like a dynamically generated credential from Vault. Um, and if, if, uh, if a credential that comes from Vault is dynamically generated, uh, even if it's brokered, boundary will take over ownership of that lease. And what it will do is it will say, okay, uh, when that session is done, when all connections for that session have, have, uh, have expired and the session is terminated, I'll actually go to Vault and I'll just say, please revoke this right now. Um, so we don't wait for it to just time out, we, we tie it to the lifetime of the session. Um, so going back to the SciGram for a moment, um, you know, I mentioned that the injection happens on the worker. You know, I said before, like, nothing is returned when we're doing injection to the, the user. The injection happens on the worker. Boundary's credential injection support is agentless, um, which means you know you don't run an agent to do it, right? You just have uh, you know we, you run our workers. Uh, you can run a few of them, and like they just take care of the rest. Um, why is it agentless? Uh, well, some systems can't run an agent um, if you're consuming SaaS stuff. So you know we can uh, we can gate access to things like um, manage Postgres, you know Aurora RDS or something. If you're using that, you can't just go run an agent on Aurora. Uh, and and you know uh, and use that to uh, uh, let's say um, you, you can't just run an agent there and use that to um, to handle credential injection, right? So you would need some interim system anyways. Even if it was some agent, you'd end up having to like run run and operationalize that in a Docker container or a Lambda or EKS or something. You have to do something in order to actually get that there. So you know some systems simply can't run it. Um, this is an important one, the ability to cut off boundary from a credential source of compromise. So let's say that you think that boundary is compromised in some way, shape, or form. I certainly hope it never is, uh, but you know, and if you're dealing with security at all, you sort of assume that at some point everything will be compromised, and you sort of plan for you know, having the blast radius be as small as possible. It's just what you gotta do. Um, so if, uh, if, if, you know, if you believe the boundary is compromised, you wanna say, okay, I don't want anyone like, getting in through boundary because I think they're getting to things they shouldn't. Um, then what you can do is you can just say revoke boundary's token in vault, right? And now boundary can't get those credentials that it uses to either give to the user from, for brokering or to inject uh, for credential injection. It can't actually do that. 
And so you have this like break glass scenario by having a separation of concerns between your credential source and, uh, uh, and boundary itself. Now, we do have a built-in credential store, uh, and that's useful for all sorts of things, you know, um, especially if you aren't running Vault. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice separation of concerns if you are. Uh, provisioning, securing, configuring, and managing, and updating. So, um, you know, when we were first looking at building Boundary, we talked to a lot of our existing Vault customers and a lot of other HashGrip customers and, you know, asked, like, if we build this, like, you know, we could go agentless, we could go agent, and they said, please don't make us run another agent, please. Um, because, you know, agents have some issues. They, uh, you know, they, not only do you have to like configure the life cycle and manage them, but you have to secure them. And in some cases, they can sort of end up pushing that burden of security onto every individual host instead of something that's more central. And so we didn't want to require that of users. Um, and also, finally, like native auth and auth support. Now this is sort of, you know, you may deem this a pro and a con, and when I actually get to the considerations, the cons, I actually go back to this. Um, you know, this means that if you're comfortable with OpenSSH, let's say, and you know OpenSSH, and you know how to operationalize it, you know how to configure it, you know how it works, then this means that you just use OpenSSH as you always have, you get it from your distro packages, and everything just works the way that it, it always has. And uh, you know, that, that can be kind of nice. Like, these are well-understood, battle-tested servers that you often just get from your distro, the security updates come from your distro, it's very easy to do. Um, and that's, you know, that can be a very nice thing. Uh, considerations. So, one of the things that you know is a consideration is we need to support decoding for each protocol, um, or as we like to joke internally, uh, doing things the hard way. Um, if you are a fan of the game V V V V V V, that's six V's, um, and named because of all the spikes everywhere, uh, you'll know the pain of this this uh, screenshot very 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 well. But it's uh, it's very aptly called doing things the hard way, and we sort of like to joke about that as well. Um, so you know. Needing to support decoding for each protocol is, also, is hard. That's complexity that we have to take on as the developers of Boundary. Um, we have to take on that complexity to, uh, you know, to decode all these protocols, and some of them are extremely complex. And sometimes there are implementations we can reuse, and sometimes there aren't. Um, and so that's, you know, that's complex. Uh, I talked about the benefits, potentially, of native auth and auth-z. Um, the flip side of that is that if we want to layer in just our own auth and auth-z and not have you deal with those things, um, we can't do that without an agent. Um, and easier offboarding. Uh, this is actually a, a pro and a con. It makes it easy to onboard, right? You don't have to set up agents on all your hosts. Uh, very easy to get going. Just set, you know, stand up a worker, you know, give, it, give it some credentials in the static credential store to get started, test it out. You know, it, it's easier onboarding, but also means if you want to get off boundary, you know, we sure hope you don't, we sure hope you like it, but if you want to get off boundary, it's actually easier to, uh, to do so. Um, but you know, uh, we like to be nice to you even if you decide not to use our stuff. So uh, we sure hope you don't offboard, but um, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's there. Um, so you know, we may support an agent for extra functionality someday, but it will be optional. Um, there are just some things that you can't do if you don't have an agent on host. Uh, fundamentally, like there are just uh, you know certain types of recordings uh, when we get to session recording, um, certain types of of, uh, of capabilities that you can uh, that you can run. I don't want to go into like a lot of detail because it's a very varied sort of field, but there are just some things that you need an on host agent for that has like that's very privileged. Um, in order to do, and, and, uh, and so we may have an agent someday, but it'll be optional because you know, there are these core kind of benefits that you get from, uh, from having an agentless sort of approach. Okay, so that was, uh, that was discussion of you know, credential injection and, and all the considerations that we take into it. So just to wrap up, um, you know, Boundary provides secure network access. We built this multi-hop system into, um, into Boundary and enables private vault access that we can then take advantage of for credential injection, um, as well as feature capabilities like multi-hop session proxying. Uh, Boundary currently supports uh, injecting SSH credentials into sessions. Uh, currently, it's username, password, and username, private key, and, and eventually it'll be uh, uh, certificate support that's happening now. These are uh, HP Boundary sort of um, extra features. And there's a Learn Lab with Robin Beck. Um, I believe it's still in Platinum F through J, but check your schedule. Uh, these slides had to be turned in like three weeks ago. Um, so if it has changed, uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, check it out. Um, but at the Learn Lab, you can actually you know, uh, try all this stuff for yourself. Um, and it's, it's, it's super cool. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Um, check out boundaryproject.io to learn more, access uh, learn guides and docs. Check out HTTP Boundary. Um, 
I can't take questions here, but I will be available afterwards uh, over there for any questions that are around. So thank you very much. Thank you.